news is that everyone is a potential victim. But the good news is that everyone is a potential solution. Sensitize the masses to sanitize. Keep a social distance and quarantine. Stop! The coronavirus is sweeping over mankind. Everybody must be alert. This is a global pandemic we can never take for granted. Clean and personal hygiene and make sure you regularly wash your hands. Keep a distance from everyone. Report anything like a simple tomb. Serious fever is a simple tomb. Dry cough is a simple tomb. Walk with camera is a simple tomb. Itchy eyes and flu is a simple tomb. This is AUP's webinar, Masks 101, and today is Thursday, July 16th, 2020. I'm going to explain what you can expect, our agenda, the objectives, and how you can participate. We think this webinar is going to take a little bit more than one hour. We might go a few minutes past, especially if we're getting lots of great questions. Let me, um, let me carry on by mentioning that Wherever you're joining us from in Alberta, you find yourself on treaty lands. And I would like to acknowledge that the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island inhabited this land uh, long before settlers ever arrived. Um, we are all treaty peoples and you find yourself either on treaty eight, six, seven, four or 10 lands. We appreciate how indigenous cultures and uh, languages continue to enrich our communities today. I'd also like to reaffirm that across Canada and the United States, indigenous peoples, black people, people of color and their allies are all standing up in defense of civil rights and against systemic racism. We wanna show solidarity with everyone who, because of the color of their skin is subject to police brutality and other forms of racism. Well, what can you expect from this webinar? We have several things we hope that by the end of it, you'll take away. First, that you'll be able to explain the use of personal protective equipment and other ways to protect against viral respiratory infections like COVID-19. By the end of the session, you should also be able to identify the three different categories of masks, how to use them at work, who's using them, when to use them. Finally, we hope you know what steps to take if your employer is not providing you appropriate personal protective equipment or PPE on the job and who to contact to ask for help. So how are we going to do this? We have an agenda and we're going to start the webinar off with a video. We're really excited to share this uh, three minute video called Masks 101. It's a cartoon and hopefully it explains a lot of things that maybe some of you already know, but there might be some new information in it as well. We're gonna do a presentation, and in that presentation, we're gonna cover five key points. We're first gonna explain a little bit about shifting norms, and I'd like to share a labor history story with you as well. Then we're gonna dive into the COVID-19 pandemic and how masks are being used as just one of many controls. We're gonna pause there to take some questions, especially about things we've already covered up to that point, and then we're gonna dive into the last three points, distinguishing the three categories of masks, steps for using non-medical masks, and how to address problems at your work site. We're going to uh, take more of your questions at that point. Some of them might be saved up until the very end for us. And we're gonna end off with a call to action. 
A friendly reminder that the information provided in this webinar is only intended for educational purposes. It is not meant to be legal or medical advice. We are not lawyers or doctors and we don't know your specific situation. With that, let me introduce myself. My name is Jordan Thompson. I work in AUP's education department as a union representative where I write courses and help coordinate events like conferences and I support the annual labor school. Uh, I'm very excited to have helped develop this webinar along with a wonderful team. And I'll turn it over to one of my colleagues to introduce themselves right now, Erez. Hi everyone, my name is Erez Raz and I'm one of the OHS representatives here at AUPE. Thank you and welcome. Thanks, Erez. Erez is going to be my co-panelist and guest. He's going to be explaining a lot of the material that we're covering this webinar. Hey, uh, Christina, your turn. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Mesquita. I work in the Education Department of AUPE. I have the honor of working very closely with Jordan and Lindsay Ruth, as well as with others of our staff, such as Eras from our OHS department. I just also wanted to point out that you're going to see our videos on the right side of the screen. If you hover your mouse above, you will see that there's some options that come up. So you can change how you view us if you just want to see the person speaking or move us around the, spe the screen or minimize us altogether. I will also be dealing with the chats. Um, so this will be where you can post, where you can post um, questions. Well, I will, sorry, not where you can post questions. That's incorrect. Well, I will be posting resources. Questions will be answered by Lindsay Ruth and she's going to go into more details in regards to what that is. Thanks, Christina. Over to you, Lindsay Ruth. Hi, yeah. Hi, my name is Lindsay Ruth. Uh, I use the pronouns she and her. Um, I am in the education department um, as a rep, so I get to work closely with uh, the other reps in developing curriculum and, and webinar opportunities like this. So we're looking forward to today. So Lindsay Ruth, do you mind explaining a little bit more about how the attendees of today's webinar can interact and participate? Absolutely. So yeah, during this webinar, you can interact with the presenters using the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you kind of hover at the bottom of your screen, that'll pop up. Uh, we do invite you to ask questions related to the material at any point during the webinar. Um, you can click on it, then you type in your questions. Your questions are invisible to other attendees, and you can also pose those questions anonymously. Um, I might answer some of those questions privately, so only you will see the reply, um, but I will be saving up probably most of the questions, and I'll pose those on your behalf to the panelists at two different times, kind of halfway through uh, the session and then, and then closer to the end, and then that way everyone can hear the questions and the answers. Um, <clears throat> there are, I think, over 40 people on today, so there, I mean, there might be a lot of questions, and we might not be able to get to all of them today, so I apologize if that's the case, if you pose a question and you, and you don't get a reply or it's not posed. Um, we encourage you in that case then to phone AUPE's resource center and ask for help from your membership services officer. Um, and that 1-800 number is 1-800-232-7284. And that'll be posted a few times uh, throughout the webinar. Also, there's another way to interact. Uh, Jordan will be posting some polls, um, asking some questions related to the material. You just click on the answer that's closest to how you feel about that on-screen on question. Uh, just a note, if you're on a web browser, um, you might not be able to see the polls. And if you're on your phone, you probably won't also see those polls, obviously. But um, if, if that's the case, Jordan is going to read out the question and you can take some time to reflect on what your answer would be. Um, Christina will be monitoring, or she'll be in the chat box. And you'll notice uh, if you've done Zoom before and you've used the chat box, it's a little bit different with this webinar and that we've disabled it. So you, you actually can't use the chat, chat box. The only person who can is Christina. Um, and she will be posting helpful resources and links in there for you. So you can copy those uh, links and those resources. But if you miss any of them, do, don't worry, we're going to email out a PDF resource sheet that has all of those um, on there. Um, also, you've maybe been on Zoom before and you can, you know that there's a raise hand function. Um, you can do it, but uh, we're not going to be monitoring it, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, if you do raise your hand, you might not get a response. So uh, in short, uh, watch the chat for information and helpful resources and type your questions into the Q&A box. That's Thanks it for me. for that, Lindsay Ruth. And you know, an important reminder, if you are on your employer's work time right now or using their equipment for this webinar, please don't carry on with us. AUP is offering this webinar as a recorded session that you can register for starting Monday. And along with the recording of the webinar, you'll be able to participate in a discussion forum where you can 
pose questions and AUP staff like Arez or other people from the OHS department can contribute to your discussion as well. So again, you should not use your employer's computer or internet connection to be doing this webinar. Well, we promised a video and we shall deliver. Let's get started with this video. It will take me just a moment to queue up so that you can all view it. You may need to adjust your volume in order to uh, hear it at a sound that you like. And like was already mentioned, you might wanna move us off screen or, or minimize the box so it doesn't block your view. Let's go ahead and watch this show. I hope you enjoy. What are they? How are they different? Who is wearing them? Who do they protect? So many questions. Here's a quick Masks 101. We know that COVID-19 is passed on through respiratory emissions such as droplets from someone's nose, mouth, or the aerosolization of those emissions. Wearing a mask can help prevent that spread. It creates a barrier. There are several types of masks. N95 respirators, procedure or surgical masks, and homemade cloth masks. The N95 respirator mask is tight fitting and filters out 95% of particles. Using it properly requires a fit test. It can be hot and uncomfortable. Frontline workers in health and other government services use them. These masks are especially important for coming into contact with confirmed or suspected cases of COVID-19 during aerosol-generating procedures, such as intubating a patient. Procedure masks, also called surgical or medical masks, are looser fitting and are meant for single use. They protect the wearer and others from droplets of liquid. You might be required to wear them at work, depending on your work site and type of work. Workers in many settings who cannot maintain physical distancing are wearing them. What about when you're not at work and you want something that makes you and those around you safer? Homemade cloth masks or any other cloth face covering is an option. Cloth face coverings are not as effective as the masks prioritized for frontline workers, but they can help protect others from you if you are sick and are unaware of it, and are better than not wearing anything. Once you have used a disposable mask, throw it out. Immediately wash your cloth masks after use. As soon as your cloth mask gathers moisture from your own breath, replace with a clean dry one. And remember, your hands must be clean when you put on and take off a mask. And do not touch the mask or your face while wearing it. The virus can be present on surfaces that you have touched. Wearing masks is the responsible choice. The more people who choose to wear masks while buying groceries or running other errands, the less easily coronavirus can spread in the community. But don't think wearing a mask means you don't have to take other precautions. Wash your hands with soap and water often for 20 seconds. Maintain physical distancing. Stay home if you have symptoms. Masks can help prevent the spread, but use them wisely. Hope this information helps and take care out there. We hope that video was helpful and that it might have dispelled some of the different myths that are out there about masks. Let me share the slide deck with you one more time. It'll take just a second for me to call it up. And advance the slide to our first key topic. We wanted to discuss a little bit some of the shifting norms in society about using masks. And to do this, I thought it would be helpful for us to start off by asking your opinion. So we're going to set up a poll right now. And I'm gonna launch the first question. You're gonna see some options on the screen. I'll read it out loud. Pick the answer that you feel is closest to how you feel about this question. With some exceptions, maybe for medical reasons or some other reason, do you believe that Alberta employers should require workers to wear masks in the workplace? Go ahead and click either yes, you agree, or no, you disagree, or you're not sure. I'll leave the poll open for just a couple more minutes and moments, and I'll, I'll share back the reply to everyone.
Okay, just a couple more seconds and we'll close the poll and I'll share back the results with everyone. Well, that's pretty interesting and a little bit different than the results we saw in yesterday's webinar. Uh, today, people on this call are saying that 61% of you or 25 people, yes, Alberta employers should require workers to wear masks in the workplace. Six people or 15% said no, and many people, 10 or 25% said that you're not sure. I have a second question for you, and it's a little bit different. Answer this one for me, would you? With some exceptions, maybe for medical or other reasons, should the government of Alberta require individuals to wear masks or face coverings in all indoor public spaces? So maybe this would be a retail store uh, where you get your groceries or uh, recreation centers. Anywhere that's indoors, should you have to, by some kind of an ordinance, wear a mask? Either yes, you agree, the government should make this mandatory, no, you disagree, or you're not sure. I'll leave the poll open for a few seconds. Go ahead and click your reply. I'm gonna end the poll and share back the results with everyone. You know, actually, your answer to this question was pretty similar to the first one. It seems that if you felt employers should mandate the use of masks in workplaces, the government should also be mandating the use of masks in all indoor public spaces. Um, some of you disagreed, about 20% or eight people. Um, around the same number of people seem to be unsure. Hopefully in this webinar, our discussion will uh, inform your thinking about this. Maybe some of you will have different answers. And I'm sure many of you would have felt very differently about these questions even just a few months ago. Um, we know that attitudes about mask wearing are shifting quickly. Erez, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, absolutely. So in normal circumstances outside of this pandemic that we're faced with currently, I think we can all agree that wearing a mask is not the preferred choice for most people uh, for many different reasons. Uh, for one, they're uncomfortable, uh, inconvenient for those who are not used to wearing them. And for others such as myself who wear glasses, they can get fogged up and causing you to see improperly and just makes it an inconvenience. Uh, in other instances, such as cultural, uh, you know, imaginations wearing a mask can make us think of bad guys or villains who disguise themselves in order to commit a crime. Yeah, I agree. It's something you see in movies, right? And it's pretty normal to have mixed feelings. I'm one of the people that wear glasses and my mask fogs up my glasses all the time. We have to think about the masks in the context of the broader changes happening around us. Here in Alberta, there's a rush right now to reopen the economy, to try to recover from uh, the big downturn that uh, the province is experiencing. And so we're seeing an increasing number of workplaces requiring employees who had had the luxury of working from home to now return to the workplace. I think we also need to step back and look at the longer arc of changes that are happening in masks during this pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. What a difference four months makes. You know, at the start of this coronavirus outbreak, the line was simple. If you're well, don't wear one. And then by April, public health officials like Dr. Teresa Tam were saying, we don't know if non-medical masks are effective at slowing the spread of COVID. And then as of July 7th, millions of residents in both Toronto and Ottawa uh, are under mandatory orders to wear masks. Uh, Quebec is joining them on Saturday. Uh, Mayor Nenshi and is looking at possibly doing the same thing in Calgary if things don't change there. And Banff is also looking at that. Uh, further to that, AUP or Alberta U Nurses Union, UNA, has also called for mandatory masking in this province. So things are definitely shifting. Part of those changes have to do with our scientific understanding of the virus that causes COVID, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, what we know about its transmission seems to be changing really we, there's a lot we don't know yet right uh, i saw that just last week a group of scientists um, signed a joint letter that they addressed to the world health organization calling on it to review the model that they use that explains the transmission of the virus so you know there's been some significant shifts part of those are because of the increase and in spread of the pandemic but also just because of science um, you know, there's
plenty of resources out there. Erez, is there anything in particular people might want to look at regarding that? Absolutely. So a good place to start would be, uh, you know, getting familiar with the global health advice, which is available from the World Health Organization. And then you've got the regional ones, uh, such as Alberta.ca and so on, who take advice from those individuals. Uh, if you check in your chat box, uh, Christina has posted the advice on the use of masks in the context of COVID-19. Uh, it's a document that you can read. But please keep in mind that if you are reading that, things are shifting constantly. So things are, as they find new things, they're changing. Thanks a lot for that, Arez. Um, I want to tell a story from labor history. What do you have to say about that, Arez? Well, we know that at AUP, we love learning about labor history and you are the history guru. So I'm going to let you go ahead and you know, tell us a little bit about you know, the present day challenges. Thanks, I appreciate that vote of confidence. I guess it just comes down to how, you know, the more we know about the history of workers, the better prepared we should be to face the challenges we have today. And recently some historians have been speaking to the media about lessons that we can learn from pandemics in the past. Um, there was one in 1918, 1919, an influenza pandemic that um, was incorrectly named the Spanish flu. That's a story in of itself. Uh, but one of the historians talking about this is Esselt Jones. And I really like Esselt because she writes a lot about workers and the working class. And Christina's sharing a link to a five minute video you can watch of her talking a little bit about it. Let me try to summarize uh, the story and some of the lessons that we can learn from it. Um, in 1918, Canadian troops were fighting uh, Germany in the trenches in Europe, and suddenly word got back to Canada that many more of them were dying, not from the combat, but actually from the spread of a new disease. Canadians were shocked, but they weren't really afraid because they thought, oh, Europe's really far away. Well, by the fall, uh, armistice and the end of the war was in November, uh, many of the troops were coming home and they traveled by rail across Canada, spreading the disease very, very quickly. As Canadians got sick and many started to die, um, cities began to implement health and safety measures similar to the ones that we lived through this spring. So that reminds me of how the coronavirus started in Wuhan, China and spread from there. A lot must have changed since 1918 though, hasn't it? Yeah, you're right. Although both in 1918 and today, we're dealing with new diseases that hadn't previously been known to people, uh, there were several big differences. One of them is that at that time, the economy was not shut down completely and people did not receive any money from the government. In 1918, people forced themselves to keep going to work, actually. They were afraid of losing their jobs and they needed the money to pay for the treatment of sick family members. Remember back then there was no universal medical system to help people out. There were also very few unions. Um, so today we have those advantages. It's because of unions that we have paid sick leave time that helps to fight pandemics. The other big difference was that in 1918 we didn't have the World Health Organization until 1948. It didn't exist and there was no global organization supporting governments and providing them advice so that the response to the pandemic was coordinated. Governments were left to muddle through it on their own and many of them did implement mandatory masking rules. On your screen on the left, you see a photograph of a poster that we got from Alberta's Glenbow archives. And it's from the Alberta Department of Health in 1918. You see it instructs the public on how to make their own mask to help slow down the spread of influenza. This masking is nothing new. People were doing it for a long time in previous pandemics. And these two photos are also from Alberta. At the top, you see a group of bank employees and there's three men believed to be in Alberta uh, wearing masks, working outdoors together. Um, you know, uh, I think initially people responded well to the masking rules. Uh, they wanted to follow the rules for the sake of the troops. The government appealed to their sense of patriotism. But when the war ended, many of the mask rules were um, taken away and people stopped wearing masks so much. I think you can guess what probably happened. Uh, the number of flu cases spiked and 
the death rate dramatically increased so that by January 1919, uh, many cities were imposing mandatory mask rules for a second time. Okay, so what's the bottom line then? What lessons should we take away from this, Jordan? I think that when historians look back, they're saying that the curve was flattened best and most quickly in those communities where the mask rules were put in place early and where the rules were left in place the longest. One of the biggest lessons that Essel Jones points to from the 1918 pandemic is that trust in public health authorities is so important. When the measures that they recommended started to work and the rate of infection slowed down, there was a lot of pressure coming from the government and from big business to get things moving again and to ease up on the restrictions. And what they saw was that uh, as restrictions were lifted, the disease came roaring back. Um, when you ease up too early or you stop wearing masks, the disease returns. Okay, so that makes sense to me. It's similar to what's currently occurring in some areas here within our province where people are believing that things aren't so bad and it's easy when doing something like wearing masks is working to forget that the disease is still extremely dangerous. Yeah, I think so too. We've seen photos recently coming from Banff and Sylvan Lake. It's important that people remain vigilant and follow the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Let's shift now to a bit more practical material. I'd like to explore with you, Arez, this idea from occupational health and safety of the control. Can you tell me what controls are and um, what is this hierarchy of control that uh, we have up on the screen right now? Absolutely. So control means that you've taken all the steps needed to protect workers from injury or disease. Uh, hazard control is an approach in scientific fields such as occupational hygiene, which we're currently dealing with, in which we assess and evaluate those hazards and then take steps to eliminate them, which means remove them from the workplace or control them. Uh, PPE, as you see on the thing on the uh, slide, is the least effective means of protecting yourself from a workplace hazard. There are other things that should be implemented first, like eliminating the hazard or designing an engineering solution or administrative procedure that separates you from the hazard. That's what we talk about when we talk about hierarchy of control. So when I look at elimination, which is controlling uh, or physically removing the hazard, that's not necessarily going to happen currently because we do not have any kind of, uh, you know, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, vaccine. Okay, I think I get it. Like, we won't actually eliminate the virus until there's a vaccine or a treatment, right? Exactly, right? So what we look at is physically trying to remove that from being right at the worker. So what we do then is we put in place certain things such as equipment guards like plexiglass or workstation design so you are able to maintain the six feet apart. Those are you know, considered engineering controls. And then you look at substitution, possibly working from home so you're not exposed to the hazard at the workplace. And then you've got administrative controls, which are you know, policies and procedures that the employer puts in place to ensure that workers are safe. Uh, signs, right? And limiting certain things within the workplace so not everybody's congregating at once. Okay, so maybe like an employer will design a new thing where they stagger re-entry to the workplace so there aren't a lot of people congregating at pinch points or something. That would be an administrative adjustment. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, you said that PPE is at the bottom of this hierarchy of uh, most effective to least effective. Um, tell me more about why. What, um, why do we do that last? Well, it's least effective because it doesn't actually do anything to remove the hazard. All we do is provide the last line of defense at the worker. Uh, PPE is meant to be temporary and as a final method of protection, it is meant to be used until a more effective hazard control technique can be used. It can also be used with other methods such as the ones we talked about, which is the engineering and administrative to ensure full protection. So the type of PPE that you're going to be using depends on different things, right? Like what? Yeah, absolutely. So the type of personal protective equipment PPE includes things such as masks, gowns, gloves, face shields. The PPE will depend on your work environment, work conditions, and the tasks that are being performed and the other controls that have been put in place. 
uh, wearing masks at the work site and expecting others to do so as well uh, has been seen as you know part of long time centuries fight for safe workplaces. Yeah, I think it's helpful if we don't think about wearing masks as the same as the hospital masks that have been in place for a long, long time. It's better if we think of it as the broader veil of different types of PPE that have come about, uh, usually because a worker is demanding it, right? Like I'm thinking, for example, of a face shield that a welder would use or the harness that people working on roofs or high spaces, window washers might use. If you see mask in a context of that, it's actually just one more form of protecting ourselves at the job. Usually employers are reluctant to pay for those sorts of things. We only really get them because we demanded them. Exactly. So workers and their unions have demanded face masks in this pandemic because when they didn't have them, they were the first ones to get infected. In certain workplaces, as we've been hearing about, uh, workers in hospitals, grocery stores, meat packing plants, and senior care homes, just as some examples of those uh, areas where face masks were demanded and are now provided. Uh, each piece of PPE has specific use and may be made of specialized materials, appropriate for one use or activity, but not appropriate for another. It is also important to remember that wearing the right PPE is important, PP does not reduce the workplace hazard, nor does it guarantee permanent or total protection for the wearer. Simply having PP or making it available is not enough, though. I've heard there's actually a lot of design problems with PPE. Like, for example, that when uh, an engineer or scientist is developing it, they might do so for one particular body type, and it doesn't work for lots of different people. Yeah, absolutely. That's been a problem that we've seen as well and have heard about. So in order to actually have any usefulness, workers should only use PPE specifically selected considering the specific hazard and the degree of protection that is required. PPE should be usable in the presence of other workplace hazards. Uh, users should be trained in proper use and fit of the PPE and employers must provide the training on how to do so. Employers should also properly store and maintain the PPE and if PPE is worn out or defective, it should be discarded and replaced. Gotcha. Thanks for that, Arez. Those are some important things to keep in mind about how to use PPE correctly. Let's talk a bit more about COVID-19 specifically. It's one of many types of human coronaviruses. They cause infections through our, excuse you, <laughs> throat, nose, um, mouth, and lungs. They're most commonly spread uh, from an infected person through respiratory droplets. You either breathe those in directly or you can touch something that the droplets have rested on and then you become infected if you touch your mouth, eyes or nose. Um, That's right. So current evidence suggests that person to person spread is most efficient or more likely to happen when there is close contact. The contact is prolonged or you're in crowd spaces or in closed spaces. Masks protect the, by creating a barrier covering your nose and mouth, and then that reduces the amount of droplets containing COVID either coming out of you or the amount that you're receiving. They're not perfect, but any mask or face covering is better than no barrier at all. You should always protect yourself, first and foremost, by washing your hands frequently, avoid touching your face, and maintaining this at least six feet or two meters distance between you and the other people who are not part of your household or cohort. In addition to these measures, masks are being used in work and increasingly out in the community. Thanks. Yeah, everyone, I'd like you to check your chat box because Christina is going to post a link to the Government of Alberta's page about masks. Of all the many resources we're going to share during this webinar, if you had time to only look at one, I would say this is it. Take a good look at this web page. There's a lot of information on it. There's several different videos. Um, there's lots of subsections on the web page. But if you're familiar with the information there, you're going to be able to protect yourself using a mask during this pandemic much better than if you didn't review those resources. So please take a look at that one. With that, I'd like to invite Lindsay Ruth to pose any questions that might have come in up to this point, especially questions that are related to material we've already covered. We might save some of those other ones towards the end. Yeah, um, I think 
this question could be asked later on as well, but I'm also mindful of, you know, in case somebody hops off the webinar early, it would be nice to have their, their question uh, answered. So Absolutely. this is about how, and it, it does have to re relate to wearing the pop, you know, PPE properly. So what side of the mask should be against your skin? There's a white side and a blue side, and I've heard differing answers. I've got, this is one of the disposable non-medical ones, but I know that even with, you know, a lot of these surgical masks, there's the two colors, right? And what I've heard is that it's the, the blue or the colored side out. So I'm wondering if, Erez, are you? Yeah, that is correct. That is the correct way to do it. Uh, we have heard of situations where individuals have had a poster saying that if you wear the blue side out, you're protecting others. And if you wear the white side out, it protects you. Uh, that is false. You have to wear it properly, and that's part of wearing the PPE properly and not making that mistake. So white side in when it comes to those types of masks. Okay. Yeah, I've heard comments like show your color or blue to the sky. So yes, yeah. blue goes out. So little things like that. Yeah, somebody just actually wrote blue to the sky. So. <laughs> awesome. Um, Great question. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I'm going to save the other question for later because I think it's a bit more relevant to, to the stuff that we're going to be covering. And this is a great reminder to our 50 plus viewers out there today. Go ahead and type in questions that you may have. Um, Lindsay Roos is going to answer some of those privately um, and then pose some of those questions to Arez and I towards the end of the, the webinar. Let's move on with our presentation. Um, you know, we could ask this question that might seem a little obvious and it's, is COVID-19 a hazard in our workplaces? To answer that, we need to be really specific about what a hazard is. And in Areza's work and in the field of occupational health and safety, we like to lean on the law that is designed to protect workers. Arez, can you tell us a little bit about this? Absolutely. So what we utilize uh, on a daily basis is the legislation, which is the law that speaks to workers' health and safety. And that is the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which includes the code and regulations for most workers in Alberta. Uh, some who work in federal industries are covered under the Canada Labor Code. Uh, so with that, we take the definition of a hazard out of that book. A hazard, according to the act, means a situation, condition, or thing that may be dangerous to the health and safety of the worker. So, by definition, is COVID a hazard? Absolutely, of course it is. There's a pandemic out there and COVID-19 is a hazard in any workplace where a worker comes into contact with another human being. For AUPE members who provide frontline services to the public, COVID-19 is a significant hazard because of your heightened risk of exposure. You should also have a hazard assessment for your job. Part 2, Section 7 of the OHS Code requires your employer to assess your work site and identify the hazards before the work begins or if a work process is changed. This assessment is a document that is specific to your job and describes methods used to control such hazards. Okay, I get it. So a hazard assessment is a special document created by the employer, but sometimes by employers and employees together. And it's supposed to describe the controls that are put in place. Did I get that right? Yes, absolutely. I want to invite everyone attending to do a third and fourth poll with us right now. Let me post this poll. It's about what Arez was just talking about. And I want to see what out there you all have to say about this. The question is, have you ever read the hazard assessment document for your job? We have a couple options here. Yes, your employer has provided it to you, and yes, you've read it. The second option is no, I have not yet read it, but my employer did at least provide it to me. The third option is no, I have not yet read my hazard assessment because my employer has never provided me a copy. And the final option is I don't know. I'll leave this open for a couple of minutes and uh, I'm really curious to see um, among our viewers today where you're at with hazard assessments. I'll give a couple more seconds here because there are several people that haven't replied yet. Go ahead and reply to this poll. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now and I'll share back the results with you. If you didn't get a chance to uh, answer, that's okay. Um, it was just meant to give us a quick idea. This is really interesting. Um, a good majority of people on the call today have viewed and read their hazard assessment. And that's great. That's what we want to see. 
um, the more informed you are, uh, the more that you're exercising your right to know, one of the fundamental health and safety rights, uh, the better and safer you and your coworkers are. Where we get concerned is with the replies of all the other people. I'm seeing four plus six plus two, around 12 people have told us that they don't know about their hazard assessment or they've not yet read it. Um, this is worrying. And we want to challenge you, everyone on this call today, to go ask your employer to view your hazard assessment. It's something that they're required to do by law. It's right there in the OHS code. They are mandated to provide you this information. I'm gonna launch a second and final poll, uh, or a fourth and final poll, and I'd like you to go ahead and answer this one. It's really just for the people who have already read their hazard assessments. For those of you that know, does your hazard assessment describe controls for preventing the spread of viral respiratory infections like COVID-19? You could reframe this as, has your hazard assessment been updated to deal with the pandemic? So yes, uh, my hazard assessment does have that. Uh, no, my hazard assessment has not yet been updated and has no specific controls for preventing the spread of COVID-19, or you don't know. I'll end the poll um, in just one moment, give you a couple more seconds to type in your replies. And I'll go ahead and share this back with everyone. What do you think? Uh, what are the numbers like? Here they are. Not even 50% of the people who have a hazard assessment that they're familiar with are saying that it has anything in it about viral respiratory infections or COVID-19. This is worrying. That means uh, 18 people have answered saying that their hazard assessment is inadequate. It does not address the current pandemic that we're in. And a really important thing that we wanna tell everyone is that the law at part two in section eight of the OHS code requires your employer to involve you in the hazard assessment and in the controls. I res mentioned part seven, that's about the hazard assessment. Uh, section eight goes even further and it says, you actually should be allowed to be involved in this. So uh, speak up, you know, in your workplace, go asking for it. We wanna encourage you to take action, find out who your um, members are of the Joint Worksite Health and Safety Committee and uh, go directly to your supervisor. Ask your supervisor to see your hazard assessment and to make sure that the COVID-19 controls are in there. Well, let's move on a little bit more about masks. We have three broad categories we wanna share some information about with you in this webinar. Erez, can you get started on this first category, the N95 respirator? Absolutely. So. One of the three types that we're gonna be discussing today is the N95. It is a respiratory protective device designed to achieve a very close facial fit and very efficient filtration of airborne particles. To work properly, it must be fit tested and the wearer cannot have any facial hair, which means I cannot wear it. The edges of the respirators are designed to form a seal around your mouth, mouth and nose, and the N95 protects both the user and others quite effectively. Surgical N95 respirators are commonly used in healthcare settings. Oh, hang on a sec. So I am closely shaven. I had a shave this morning, but I don't work in healthcare. And I've heard that these are kind of like the gold standard. I want to use it. Shouldn't I go ahead and use it? You can if you have one, but as a worker, if the employer is not supplying you with that, it's due to the global demand that these masks are currently in. And it's not recommended for public's general use. They are prioritized for medical personnel, especially ones who are exposed to aerosol generating procedures. So in other words, hospital staff doing procedures like medical ventilation of a sick individual or intubation when a tube goes, is put down someone's throat to maintain an open airway. So these are the kind of personnel using the N95 currently. Uh, there are also some specific cases in other jobs uh, where the employer has identified specifically via the hazard assessment for those individuals to use it. But that's more of an exception. So by the way, N95 respirators are not reusable and we do not recommend washing or reusing these types of masks. And there is certain ways of decontaminating the respirators, but according to Alberta Health Services, who is currently using them, 
uh, they said that they've got adequate supplies, but at some point, if the stock decreases, they will reevaluate and decontaminate as per the guidelines that are put out there. Okay, so maybe safer if I don't try to reuse them or wash them. Gotcha. No. One other thing to be aware of is that there are counterfeits out there. Some fraudsters have marketed counterfeit respirators that are of poor quality and they're not safe for use. They mislabel them as being approved by the National Institute of Occupational Health and Safety, a US governing body abbreviated as NIOSH. Um, what we're gonna do is post some links for you to help uh, be aware of this problem. Christina is gonna share a list, a link to a list of known counterfeit respirators, as well as a web page from Health Canada where members of the public and workers are asked to please report masks that they discover as being uh, fraudulently labeled. One way of protecting yourself, pro tip here, is to take a look at the box that the respirators have come in and check that they are authentic by looking at the labeling that comes on them. Okay, I wanna bring Christina in the discussion here because I've heard she's something of a mask wearing pro. Christina, can you tell us a bit of our uh, second category of masks here? I'm not a mask wearing pro, but I do watch a lot of medical shows. So I've seen these type of masks that look similar to this in medical shows, in medical procedures, medical facilities. Now this one is the one provided by the government. And so these are not the medical grade, but they look similar to the medical grade masks. So I wanna just talk about how these are similar and different from medical grade. And Lindsay Root's gonna go more into um, the non-medical grade masks. So I'm talking about the surgical mask and or medical grade masks. Um, these are the similarities between what we have received or what we could buy in stores to the medical grade masks are they still cover the mouth and the nose. Um, they're not to be reused or shared with others and are disposable. And it does not filter or block all the particles in the air because as those of us have worn it, we notice that there's a gap when we wear it. And this doesn't provide a, a tight seal because as they are loose fitting, hence the N95 mask that Irez pointed out is regarding as more protective to our frontline workers who are being exposed to the small particles. The difference between the surgical masks that, that, that are used in medical professions and those that, are, that we're getting from the government or combined, combined stores is one, they try to help us by labeling them and they can be labeled as surgical, isolation, dental, or medical. Um, and what makes them different is they're standardized and tested for quality. So there's a different thickness to those masks than the ones we're getting in the stores or the ones we're getting at the drive-through. Um, and this is to protect the, for the protection of medical professionals and patients of liquids, airborne bacteria, and viruses. So it reduces exposure to saliva, large particles from the, that can be released from the mouth to the nose, and it can prevent certain, certain diseases such as influenza and SARS. These masks protect both the user and the, anybody they interact with if both are able to use it. Obviously in surgery, sometimes this isn't the case, but it does provide an extra layer of protection than the ones that we, that we are purchasing right now. And I've had questions before about how long these masks can be used for. The surgical masks are recommended to only be used for four hours. After four hours, they should be disposed of and changed. Um, so this is this just gives it this reduces the quality of the mask if it's worn for longer. So that's the recommendation. Hope that helps everyone, and I'll pass it back to Jordan. Thanks a lot, Christina. Awesome. Well, let's move on to the final category of mask. The other main category we're hearing lots about is this non-medical mask. And this is a broad category that includes everything from homemade cloth masks to non-disposable, non, or sorry, disposable non-medical masks, like the ones that the government is giving out, or even just face coverings like bandanas or scarves. Um, I've heard that uh, Lindsay Ruth, your family were early adopters. So maybe you could share some information with us about this category. Yeah, we were. And like Leah, like you said, there's the information and the recommendations are consistently changing. Um, but we decided pretty early on to invest in some some cloth masks. So we, we have a we've got a number of these and even ones that fit my kiddo. Um, 
And so it's, I mean, we, we adopted it because it's another way to cover your mouth and your nose to prevent our respiratory droplets from contaminating other people so, and surfaces. So if we're asymptomatic and so we don't know that we're sick. Um, and so it's about protecting others and, and being that kind of responsible citizen when we're out and about um, in the grocery stores or, or doing errands. Um, also, I find that when I'm wearing one of these, it helps me from, it reminds me not to be touching my face and my nose. Um, so that's really important to me as well. Um, and it includes these cloth masks or yeah, like you said, a bandana, but all, then also these non-medical disposable masks that, that we are getting through drive throughs right now um, from the government. Um, but it's a, there's a few important things. If you choose to wear a non-medical mask or face covering, keep in mind some of this stuff, okay? So you want to make sure that it fits properly and it doesn't gape too much of the sides. And yes, they are looser fitting than an N95, but you still want it to be fitting snugly. Um, you have to be aware that it could become contaminated on the outside when you're out, out and about, you know, out in the community. So you want to definitely avoid moving or adjusting the mask while you're wearing it. Just don't touch your face while you're wearing a mask. Assume that the mask has been contaminated. So you want to take the proper precautions. So don't touch it. Um, also, if you wear a mask, you, you must wash your hands before you put it on. Um, and then you have to wash your hands before you take it off and then wash your hands again after you've taken it off or use hand sanitizer. Um, I will often take a little bag with me when I'm out. So um, if, if I'm done with the mask, I sanitize my hands, I take it off, I put it in the bag so I can take it home and wash it. Um, and then I sanitize my hands again. Um, also, if you're out wearing one for a long time, you might wanna bring some extra ones for you, especially you know, if you're wearing these cloth ones, because as soon as it becomes damp, it's done, it becomes useless. So um, you should really shouldn't be wearing it for too long. Um, so if it's damp, it's done. Take it off, switch it, put another one on. Um, yeah, I mean, it's critical to be really safe when you're handling these. I see people who are out touching their face and wearing it under their chin and, and all of that. And, and that kind of pretty much makes it useless. So that, that, uh, that mindfulness is really important. Um, also beware that, you know, if you're wearing a mask, either one of these, these disposable or non-disposable ones, it might create a false sense of security. So, oh, I've got it on, I can go and get close to people. Um, it's really important that if you're wearing one that you're still trying to do your best to maintain distance, to wash your hands, to not touch your face um, and all of that. So it's those kind of multiple levels of precautions. I gotcha. Thanks for that advice on Zeroth. There's some really good considerations in there. You know, everything from assuming it's contaminated to the frequent hand washing. And uh, I like that rule of thumb you gave us the when it's damp, it's done. By the way, everyone, if you missed picking up the free masks that the province of Alberta is distributing, it's not too late. There's a second and supposedly final round happening right now this week. So we'd encourage you to go and try to get your free masks right away. Um, this program wasn't perfect. There was a lot of things we didn't like about it. You know, it was difficult if you don't have a car, uh, if you don't like fast food or want to go through a drive through maybe you don't have one near you if you live in a remote part of rural Alberta. Supposedly, the government has addressed some of these problems, and Christina is going to post in the chat box a link to the latest information about all the alternative pickup points for those non-medical masks. The other big difference we're hearing is that there's now eight of them per baggie instead of four. So take a look in the chat box for the links. Go get your free masks from the government. Um, as taxpayers, we've already paid for them already anyway, they're ours. Um, one thing um, I just wanted to point out as well, in this category of masks, uh, cloth homemade masks are perfectly acceptable and um, if you choose to make your own, there's plenty of patterns available on the internet. One thing that we've heard that is um, really important to keep in mind is that you use as tight a weave of cotton as possible. That cotton is perfect material and that you want it to be a tight weave. Two layers is better than just one. And a test for is if it's tight enough weave is to hold it up to the light, do a window test. And if you can see light filtering through it, it's useless. Some people are putting third layers in the middle as a filter, say like a coffee filter. That's a myth. It's useless. The only thing that might work as a filter is a layer of polypropylene. That's a synthetic material that has a static charge on it. So it acts like an extra shield or a magnet attracting particles to it that gets stuck. Okay. 
Well, um, let's move on and talk a little bit more about who's wearing masks at work. Arez, over to you. Yeah, so employers should be following the guidelines of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, which states that medical masks, both N95 and procedure masks, should be kept for healthcare workers and others providing direct care to COVID-19 patients. It is important to note that other jobs within AUP, like we said earlier, may be provided with N95, but as it stands, they're primarily for healthcare workers who are coming into contact with COVID-19 patients and during aerosol generating medical procedures. Procedure masks are recommended for use by other workers who are in contact with people for prolonged periods of time and are not able to maintain at least six feet or two meters of physical distancing. Remember, if you require a mask on the job to keep you safe, according to your hazard assessment, then it's the employer's responsibility to ensure that you have all of those and the necessary equipment to stay safe, including the masks. Okay, good. So my employer is supposed to provide me with the masks that I use at work. Um, what do I do if there aren't enough masks or maybe uh, my employer hasn't provided them to me even though it's necessary? What should I do then? At that point, what I, if your employer fails to provide you adequate PPE, you should inform your supervisor that you cannot perform that dangerous task that might expose you to the coronavirus until you have the PPE and then seek immediate help. Try to resolve the problem by using your employer's internal safety reporting mechanism so for example, if you're with Alberta Health Services, you use my safety net. Uh, you can also try contacting a worker rep from the Joint Worksite Health and Safety Committee, bring it to their attention, as well as contact the UPE and speak to one of the membership services officers who are very well versed throughout this whole pandemic. They've been great. Uh, and then they would reach out to us if they're not able to provide you with the answer. The other option you have is you can always at any time contact Alberta's OHS Contact Center, and that is the Ministry of Labor's department that receives OHS complaints. You can also file an anonymous complaint with them if you're worried about the employer knowing that it was you who called. Great. Thanks for that advice. And just a reminder to everyone a while ago, we did a webinar series about your right to refuse unsafe work. If you'd like to learn more about the steps involved in that, a recording of that webinar is available in AUP's e-learning system. Just sign up for that through the online registration system. Well, um, who's doing continuous masking, Arez? Uh, what's this about? Yeah, so as per the direction of the Chief Medical Officer, AHS, uh, it was an order, so AHS had implemented a continuous masking strategy for healthcare workers. As of some other employers have done as well, such as in group homes and other congregate settings, uh, which means the masking of healthcare workers providing direct patient care or working in patient care areas in both AHS and community settings. Healthcare workers should wear a surgical procedure mask continuously at all times in all areas of their workplace if they are involved in direct patient contact or cannot maintain adequate physical distancing from patient and coworkers. Thanks for that. And just a reminder to everyone, it's not just at work that we're using masks. The Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Hinshaw, has encouraged all Albertans to wear non-medical masks in public spaces when it's difficult to maintain phys physical distancing. So in indoor public spaces, it's safer. Uh, use the precautionary principle in absence of evidence. Otherwise, it's better to do the safer thing. Um, the more people who choose to wear masks, the safer that we're all going to be. It's also choose to wear a um, important to consider the place that you're at. A lot of them can get filled up more quickly with people and that they're enclosed more easily. So uh, I'm not taking a flight or an airplane ride anytime soon, but that's definitely one place you'd be wearing a mask. Uh, you probably want to do this in grocery stores, the pharmacy, if you go to the barber or hair salon, retail stores, definitely a taxi. I heard a um, taxi driver on the news just the other day saying he's really worried because people seem more lackadaisical now than they were just even a couple weeks ago. And definitely wear it if you're on public transit. Keep in mind, your employer is not required to provide you your masks for use outside of work. So that includes activities like traveling to and from work. If you're commuting to work by bus, uh, it's considered your own time and you have to purchase your own masks for use on the bus or any other indoor public space. You already know, I'm sure, you should refrain from taking any of your employer's masks from the workplace for your use outside of work. That would be considered theft and you can get into really big trouble for taking your employer's supplies. 
Um, by the way, private sector employers can choose to require their employees to wear masks and even refuse public service to patrons who do not wear masks. That's the choice of the individual business owner, and it's probably not a violation of human rights in Alberta. Well, um, I think Lindsay Ruth is gonna try to queue up a video for us, and right after we show this four minute video, hopefully, if it works, uh, we're going to move on to questions, and it'll be question time to wrap up our webinar. We're gonna screen a short movie, um, from the CDC called Common Mask Mistakes. Hopefully this works, and if it doesn't, we'll post the link and you can watch that video on your own. Okay, we'll see if, can you see it now? Oh, you might want to adjust your volume, everyone, just so that, uh, yeah, we see it. And yes, we can see it, Lindsay Ruth. All right, I hope you can hear it too. Let me know if you can hear it. More people are wearing face masks, but many are yeah. getting it wrong. And according to medical experts, wearing a mask incorrectly can be riskier than not wearing one at all. That's one of the risks about wearing a mask is to wear it properly. Early on, health officials said the average person didn't need to wear one. But that changed as new evidence emerged. Where COVID-19 activity is occurring, use of non-medical masks or face coverings is recommended as an added layer of protection. Now some places are making them mandatory in public, but they only work if you wear them correctly. So let's look at what not to do. I would probably feel like I would want to fiddle with that mask given, uh, given the newness. First, the most common mistake is touching your mask after you put it on. Understand that uh, it is, a, for many people who haven't worn one before, an uncomfortable experience. If you've worn one, you know they can get hot, sweaty, and make it difficult to breathe. But it's more about protection than comfort. And by adjusting them, you're putting yourself at risk because your hands could be contaminated with the novel coronavirus, or the exterior of the mask could have collected germs and droplets that could contain the virus. Another mistake, some people are putting their mask on and taking it off incorrectly. Even politicians are having a hard time with this, like South Africa's president. See how he touches the podium and then touches his face? Now watch the deputy prime minister of Belgium. They both touch their face repeatedly as they appear to struggle to find their nose and mouth. And then they secure their masks. Again, rule number one, don't touch your face. The proper way is to position the mask over your nose and mouth. Then, secure it behind your ears or fasten the straps behind your head, a step the governor of Florida appears to have missed. And remember to keep your hands off the main part of the mask. The same goes when you're taking off your mask. Don't touch it like the Premier of Quebec does here. Another common mistake is not washing your hands before and after putting on a mask. You've got to wash your hands before you put it on. You've got to wash your hands after you take it off. And you never touch the surface, which means doing things like this defeats the purpose. That brings us to the next point. Masks are meant to be worn one way and not modified. So wearing it like this or like this is counterproductive. We all need to see this. And extreme modifications like this one recorded in a now well-known TikTok video aren't okay either. Well, since we have to wear them, it makes it harder to breathe. It just makes it a lot easier to breathe. Remember, the whole point is to create a barrier between you and other people. It's not to make yourself more comfortable. And if you're using a non-reusable mask, make sure you dispose of it properly. Once you've safely taken it off, immediately put it in the garbage to prevent further contamination. Then wash your hands again. If you're wearing a reusable mask, make sure you clean it in the washing machine before using it again. Ultimately, experts agree, wearing a mask is helpful. But even if you follow all of these guidelines, you still won't be invincible to COVID-19. You're just lowering the chance of spreading it. We still need to underline that this is quote, a supplementary measure that people can use, but it certainly does not replace all of the other good uh, uh, measures such as hand washing, et cetera. It's a combination of all these things that experts say will help prevent further outbreaks. Thanks a lot for sharing that video with us, Lindsay Ruth. Again, that was courtesy of um, the CBC. Let's um, share back the slides and move on to our final 
section of the presentation. Well, second last section, we're going to take questions now. And after the questions, uh, we have a call to action. Okay, we're going to end off with a call to action. Any questions burning out there that people want Arez to answer? Yeah. There's, there's quite a few questions, so I'm going to do my best here. Um, so somebody asked at their, that at their non-AUPE position, they're required to wear a mask. It's an uh, NGO. They've provided a cloth mask, but it's ill-fitting and impossible to wear for seven hours without eating and drinking. I'm thinking of asking them to provide at least one medical mask per shift so that I can safely take a break and not have to put back on a contam contaminated mask. What do you think? So it's an AUPE? Work? It's a non-governmental organization. Maybe it's a nonprofit. So it's it's not it's a not uh, not an AEP related job. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would recommend they ask them for provide masks. Right? They should. Their workers in Alberta. They should be looking to see if the hazard assessment is available and whether or not it identified that. Yeah, an employer is an employer is an employer. Just because they're in the NGO or not for profit sector doesn't mean that they should get a pass on complying with the Occupational Health and Safety Act. You should have a hazard assessment, ask them to see it and make a friendly request. I need more PPE to fulfill my job safely. Um, if you don't get anywhere with that, you might wanna consider that um, complaint line from uh, the OHS contact center. You could do that anonymously. Awesome, thanks. Um, so there's a question about gloves. What about gloves? Are gloves a good thing to wear at work or out in the public? So what they've been saying in evidence showed that gloves, again, all sense of security and what happens is you're contaminating yourself. So they're saying, such as they did in the video earlier, that the best way to maintain, you know, a sterile environment and whatnot is once you touch something or we're dealing with somebody, you go and wash your hands. That is the best advice. I'm personally choosing to use gloves when I go and gas up my vehicle. I can imagine if there's something that I frequently have to touch out in public, it might not be a bad idea to have a set in your pocket. But I think those rules that apply to putting masks on and off safely without contaminating them, wash before and after, it should be the same with gloves. You have to know how to take them off. You have to know that you have to wash your hands after you use them anyway. The other thing to consider with this is if you're using latex gloves all the time, we're just creating all this garbage. These masks are being thrown away. They're single use. Uh, so if you're able to reuse materials, um, that's great. And part of what Arez was saying that I like is that if you're washing your hands instead of using gloves, you're not adding more waste that's unnecessary. Um, so if masks are great to deter the spread, why are they not making it mandatory that clients wear masks? That way it protects the workers. Yeah. Well, again, this whole situation, in some cases they are making certain clients wear those, right? But that depends again on the hazard assessment. But you got to understand that what we do and what we deal with is strictly for workers. We cannot say what they're doing with others who are not workers. Uh, it might be again, just like Jordan said earlier, a recommendation to make to the employer that in order to protect everybody, both need to do it. I do know that some employers, when they are interacting with clients, uh, you know, for example, having a child and whatnot, they are told to be given masks to those individuals. But again, there is no obligation from the employer or enforcement to ensure that the clients are getting the proper PPE, nor training them on it, nor enforcing the fact that they are to wear it at all times. They don't have that authority. I'd encourage you to bring that recommendation forward, but not expect necessarily that your employer would change their practice. Uh, they do have a right to manage. There are employers doing that, as Arez mentioned. I had to take my son for a blood test recently and, um, the Dyna Life that we went to was uh, requiring that you wear masks to go in their door and they did a screening check at the door. It doesn't seem excessive to me. It seems actually like a wise precaution to protect the workers to ensure they're able to continue providing the services that they pr provide and, and not get infected themselves. Um, I'm going to kind of combine two questions here. So uh, the first one is if somebody has an allergic reaction to the current procedure masks that they're, they are using, is the employer obligated to provide allergy free ones? 
And then somebody also asked about asthma. So if people who have asthma symptoms, should they be wearing masks? So I guess I'm looking at kind of that sensitivity and health situation. Great questions. Absolutely. So I think what needs to happen uh, with both of those situations is they need to discuss those concerns with the employer and give an employer the opportunity to accommodate. Uh, you know, in particular, if you're allergic to what they're providing you, then yeah, they should be providing you with something else. Uh, you have asthma or difficulty breathing, again, you should be talking to your employer about that as well. Mm -hmm. cool. And if all else fails, contact your MSO, membership services officer, and ask for assistance. They might be able to deal with it via HR as well. Great, thanks. Um, how can we get fit tested for, uh, for N95 respirators? Can we follow an N95 fit test like on YouTube or online? No, that's going to be done by a specially trained, uh, qualified individual uh, who has to take the course and get certified to do so. So as an individual outside of the employer and you want to do that, there are certain agencies that will do that. Not sure if they do now because of the demand, uh, but the employer should have fit testers who come in and fit test you for those types of masks. Okay, thanks. Um, somebody shared some information about their department specifically, that, that they're, they have many members um, and it is not mandatory to wear masks in their department, or it is not mandatory? Okay, my boss sometimes wears one, but sometimes not. Uh, poor quality has been taken over their, their PPE, poor comfortability, uh, they're bad, the masks are bad smelling and not fitting well. So I guess there's just some overall concern about how PPE is being dealt with. Um, and then they also say that great info about the four hours, but on their, on their end, they change their masks every two hours for break time. And I know, Erez, you said something in the last webinar about, um, about that length of time that you wear masks. Yeah, I said it today as well, right? So, I mean, at the end of the day, if you're going for a break or eating, you take off your mask, discard it, get another one. Employers should not be restricting the number of masks that you are. Uh, kudos to that individual, right? Saying that the employer is giving it to them every two hours when they go on break, whatnot. Uh, at the end of the day, if you have any issues with your PPE, you must inform your supervisor. If you don't get any result, you need to contact AUPE, let us know. But prior to that, sorry, you need to follow your own internal reporting mechanism. So supervisor, manager, contact us and let us know. Good, thanks. Um, somebody asked about adding HEPA filters installed in the middle of a mask. I guess, I, I don't know if anyone has anything to say about that, adding filters into the middle of your masks. Jordan, maybe, I don't know. It's a good question. I won't say no because I don't know otherwise. All I do know is that I've read using some filters is not recommended. Um, they're not recommending that you put a coffee filter into a homemade mask, for example, that the only filtering layer you should put into homemade masks, as I mentioned earlier, is polypropylene fabric. The tighter weave of cotton, the better. That's the limit of my knowledge. The first I've heard of this HEPA filtering is what you're bringing to my attention. Yeah. It might be something that employers are gonna to have to consider in terms of building ventilation to make sure you remember at the start of the webinar, we mentioned that um, some scientists are dissenting and saying that it may be possible this virus actually also spreads through much tinier particles than was originally thought through these respiratory droplets. So if the virus turns out to be airborne and if the World Health Organization updates its guidelines, I presume that the different jurisdictions like Alberta's chief medical officer will then also have to update their advice. HEPA filters could become a big part of fighting this pandemic. But for now, I think the you know uh, non-medical masks. I feel this is a good enough precaution, and I don't need like a super mask. And filters within the facility would be more of an engineering control, so it'd be higher up than a PPE. Yeah, for ventilation systems. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I was mixing up the two topics. Yeah. Okay. It's just when I think HEPA, I think about the filter on my furnace in my basement sort of thing. Yeah. We also don't want people taking apart their vacuum cleaners and putting that HEPA filter if they have it into the mask either. Yeah, your reusable homemade masks that you wash can be very simple and effective. Mm. 
the real key is that the more people wearing them, the more conscientious we are about using them. That's, that's when we're staying safe. Mm -hmm. um, I guess just to reiterate kind of concerns around uh, controls at work. So there was another comment that their workplace doesn't follow the social distancing or two meter rules and they don't care about using masks. What can I do? And I know that you've already spoken about it, about um, uh, finding that hazard assessment, seeing if it's done and updated um, based on COVID, um, and then using your internal reporting mechanism to, to bring that issue up. I'm wondering if you have anything else to say about that. No, that is exactly right, uh, Lindsay. At the end of the day, uh, there's many, many sectors and workers within AUPE, so it's hard to get into specifics. And that's why we've kind of brought it all together to say, if you're not ensuring that those types of things are followed as per the Chief Medical Officer of Health's recommendations. You need to inform your employer, you need to go to your Joint Worksite Health and Safety Committee, and you need to inform AUP. Yeah. If all else fails, you can always lodge a complaint with Alberta Labour. So okay. those are the steps. There's also kind of a fourth and final option, which is mobilize your coworkers to fight back as a group. Um, we're not going to get into that in this webinar, and we'd encourage you to watch the other webinar that we did. There's a recording of that. Mm -hmm. So there was a comment from somebody who's actually a mask fit designate and that they do training. And yes, you have to be fit tested by a mask fit designate. Um, they're pointing out that the four hours on the surgical mask is something that they're not sure is correct. Um, and that in their line of work, they talk to patients about when my mask is moist, I need to discard it because it's now creating a risk on my safety that way. So um, I think that there's those two elements of like, as soon as it's damp or dirty, you have to change it, right? Absolutely. And to that person's uh, comment or question, uh, we totally agree. The minute it becomes dirty or contaminated or damp, you get rid of it. We're saying that based on the evidence, the four hours is a minimum that you are required to wear it. Unless maximum. It's, right? It's a maximum. Or sorry, a maximum. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a maximum that you are allowed to wear it. But at any time, if it becomes dirty, contaminated, or damp, or broken, you get rid of it. Okay. So don't um, think because it's dirty or ripped, I keep using it because I haven't hit four hours yet. Exactly. Um, the four hours is a maximum, whichever comes first. Either there's a need to change the mask because I'm going to go on break or the mask has reached four hours of use. Awesome. Well, I think that I, we're at almost about 20 after and, and uh, will you wrap up, Jordan? I will connect with a few other folks whose questions we haven't been able to ask. Thanks a lot for answering those final questions privately. And if you felt that you had other burning issues that you need to have addressed, please once again call AEP's 1-800 number. That's 1-800-232-7284. Ask to speak with your membership services officer who can help um, provide you some guidance and support as well. We're gonna end off with a couple calls to action. Uh, there's one urgent one at the very end. The first four that are a bit more simple are just a friendly reminder. Go ask your employer to see your hazard assessment. By doing this, you're helping um, to enforce the law yourself and make sure that your employer is following their legislated duties under the OHS code. Um, and you want to make sure that that OHS hazard assessment describes controls to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Employers need to be putting this in writing. Uh, so take a look and find out. Have a read of this document if you've never seen it before. Uh, get it updated if it's not updated yet. Another thing is to complete a survey from the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. The link is right here on the screen. Christina is going to post it in the chat box and it will be available also on the PDF that we're going to email to everyone. Know that survey is not just for Ontarian workers. This advocacy group is collecting the experiences of workers from across North America and they're using that information to inform recommendations that they're making to the government. We really like the work they do. They are a worker advocacy group and um, it is a bit of a longer survey. It takes 20 or 25 minutes, but fill that out um, this week or next week. They're gonna be closing it soon. Follow AUP on Facebook or visit AUP's webpage where on a banner called the Pandemic Information Hub, you can click to get the latest information about what's going on in your union. 
take more OHS training for us. Um, Christina, how can people um, sign up to take introduction to OHS online if they've never done that? So we take a little bit of break over the summer to re-coordinate, but you are still welcome to sign up for notifications. So when you go into the registration system, you can ask for a notification for the intro to OHS course specifically. We are offering that one online. You can also request other courses and we will be emailing out all the members who are in the registration system who are registered to notify them when registration opens. So it will start up again in September. Gotcha. Thanks for that. And once again, that recording of the previous webinar series we did is available right through the summer. You can sign up right now if you want and view that recording on your own time. Learn all about how to refuse unsafe work according to Alberta's law. The final call to action, this is really important and it's an urgent request that we're making of all AUP members. Please respond to the Alberta government's review of the Occupational Health and Safety Act before they close their review period on August 12th. To do this, go to the webpage that we've indicated here or send an email to um, the review email address, lbr.ohsreview at gov.ab.ca or send an email directly to the Minister of Labor and Edu uh, Immigration himself. I'm sure Jason Copping would love to hear from a bunch of angry AUP members who are standing up for their rights. Right now, what we're worried about is that the government may be scrapping many of the important protections that are currently in the law in the name of trying to make uh, things more flexible for employers who appear to be complaining to the government that they need innovation. We worry about these buzzwords as being used to um, be an excuse to do things like get rid of mandatory joint worksite health and safety committees, stop requiring the um, reporting of potentially serious incidents to the Ministry of Labor, um, and many other things that would weaken your protections in the law. So sign into the survey. Um, you'll see that the questions do kind of guide you towards a predetermined direction that the government is trying to move in that we're worried about. Tell the government that you believe that they should protect joint committees and ensure that all workplaces have a joint committee. Uh, we want to maintain the reporting of those PSIs or um, potentially serious incidents. Um, also, why don't you make some friendly suggestions to them of things that they should do, like hiring hundreds more OHS officers to step up proactive inspections and enforcement of the rules. We want to be prosecuting employers who are willfully showing negligence, including under the West Ray Act, in general, we should leave the OHS Act intact. Um, we do not need to introduce uh, definitions like a dangerous condition, which weakens your right to refuse dangerous work under the law. Um, so please respond to that. That's about it from us here at AUP. Um, I am at AUP headquarters, Solidarity Place, and I want to send a big thank you to joining us for our webinar today, as well as for the work that you do every day in service of Albertans. It is important and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Stay safe out there. The music today in the webinar was provided courtesy of Ugandan musicians, Bobby Wine and uh, Nubian Lee. It was called Coronavirus Alert. And just to reiterate, I know you guys have mentioned it throughout the, throughout the webinar. Um, the, the links will be sent to everyone via email through the registration system, as well as um, if you would like, there is the recording session, which will start tomorrow. You could register for it. You could watch the webinar again and get the links all over again as well. We'll get that up for everyone on Monday. We want to make Monday, sure there's sorry. actually closed captioning. There's going to be subtitles. Sure. So yeah, so like Jordan said, it'll be Monday. But yes, so you are welcome to watch it again, get the links, get all the details all over again, and share it with others. Share it with others. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you all. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. Wear masks. See you at the next webinar. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.